later this week. If you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the questions panel. We will leave time for Q&A after the presentation and address as many questions as time allows. Speaker bios and today's presentation are available in the handouts panel. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Brittany Weber, today's moderator. Brittany is VP, Director of Marketing Manager Senior at Hunting Huntington National Bank and is also the chair of ELFA's Communications Committee. For the past eight years, Brittany has been a marketing strategist supporting the equipment finance business at TCF and is now a part of Huntington National Bank. Brittany, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily. Yeah, so I've been actually part of the um, ELFA Communications Committee on and off for about six years, and our committee is always looking for great professionals, so let us know if you are interested in joining. Um, we'll have a slide later towards the end of the session with Amy Boat's uh, information from the ELFA, so you can reach directly out to her. Um, today's webinar is really special because it's actually compiled by some of our current and honorary committee members, so let me introduce them now. So Monica Bruegel is a marketing consultant with more than 20 years of equipment finance expertise that drives sales and marketing initiatives by providing specialized knowledge in business development, communications, branding, and thought leadership. Katie Eliquist is Senior Global Content Strategist and Marketing Consultant with Caterpillar Financial Services Corporation. There, she's responsible for leading content strategy to support marketing efforts. She develops content to nurture customers globally through the sales funnel, creates awareness, and builds brand loyalty. Lastly, Heather Friedman is Vice President of Corporate Marketing for Great America Financial Services. Since 2019, she's led the marketing team focused on developing and maintaining strategic marketing initiatives across all of the business units. As well as, as, as a successful small business owner herself, she also understands the demands placed on the customers that she serves and brings unique, a unique perspective and collaborative spirit to the team. So let's jump in today, into today's topic. I want to go to the next slide, thank you. Um, Monica Bruegel will start with sharing an introduction to omni-channel marketing. Next, Katie Elquist will break down how to build out a content strategy. And last, Heather Friedman will close us out by sharing a real-life case study example showing you how to bring all these principles together and execute on them. Reminder, submit your uh, questions into the Q&A panel, and we'll try to answer a couple of questions um, in between each of the presentations. Um, but we also have a lot of some time uh, towards the end of the call to answer more questions. So now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Monica Bruegel. Well, thank you, Emily and Brittany, and greetings, everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna dive in here. The three things we're gonna touch on over the next uh, 10 minutes are omni-channel approach and how that can really impact results, the review of evolution of marketing strategies, and then the effective use of the client journey map uh, that can really help with your omni-channel initiative. Next slide, please. So I put together some stats. This isn't just on the equipment financing. However, we all care about ROI. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to point out on this slide was in a recent survey, nearly 50% of companies actually indicated that the client experience was their top priority over the next two years. Comparatively, 21% of companies responded that price was a priority. So I think that really illuminates uh, how the client journey is really becoming a competitive uh, playground for all of us. Next slide, please. So the evolution of strategies, single channel is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Multi-channel, you have client experience, uh, your brand by multiple touch points. However, what's occurring is each is a different channel experience. So think of email marketing, direct mail, telesales, trade shows. Uh, what happens there is typically an inconsistent voice, inconsistent experience, inconsistent value props. Omnichannel is really flipping that, and it's more than being uh, customer, excuse me, customer uh, centric and really more than just repetitive content. It's really a client experiences your brand through those multiple touch points, and it's providing that consistent experience. So it's a seamless experience regardless of the channel and regardless of device. So whether it's a cell phone, your laptop, um, all of that experiences are synchronized. And one of the things that obviously shifting towards that omni-channel is all of the pros and cons of the previous evolution. And so companies can really use the client journey map 
to transition more into this omni-channel approach. And it's really an omni-channel experience, even though it's oftentimes called omni-channel marketing. Next slide, please. So why now? Why should we be doing a journey map? COVID. Um, all of us have been impacted, our clients, uh, our businesses, prospect businesses. So if you've never done one or only have partial purview, highly suggest doing one, especially uh, what we've incurred over the last year or two. Also for this audience, if you're unable to answer the question um, in regards to um, why aren't your approved clients booking, you'll find out that doing a map can really under help you undercover, uh, uncover some of those uh, you know, roadblocks, pain points for your clients. Uh, next slide, please. So what I pulled here is, it's a generic example. Um, it's from Lucidchart, and that is a mapping tool. And so what I wanted to, to do here is really show how the use of a mapping tool uh, can really transition your company from multi-channel to omni-channel. So high level, um, what I did was I, on the left-hand side, you'll see pretty much the main uh, so-called compartments that will be in your mapping process. The audience, and that could be by persona, and some companies don't have that level of detail on clients. So doing it by a vertical or doing it, uh, let's say for a niche within a vertical is absolutely okay. And then you define your stages. So obviously the awareness stage, consideration, purchase for our industry would obviously be financing, et cetera. And typically you'll do five to seven stages. And then if you go vertically, so for example, awareness, what are the actions that are taking place during the awareness phase? Are your clients going out, for example, to YouTube to visit one of your testimonial videos? And so under the awareness, you'll, have, you'll do the actions and then you'll itemize what marketing assets are available during the awareness stage. This could be flyers, it could be contact points like banner ads. And then you find the pain points, which really are the attrition areas. And then you obviously wanna work on your roadblocks, um, removal of those. So for example, if you have, when I pose the question, if you don't know why uh, your approved clients aren't booking, this is really the phase between that consideration and purchase, where you're going to be diving into some of those issues. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a speed round. Um, what I wanted to do was oftentimes when I'm talking to multiple companies, um, they often forget certain aspects of mapping. And so I really wanted to highlight some of the top ones. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but prospects versus repeat clients. Typically this journey is very different and highly suggest mapping both. And if you're just starting this process, oftentimes what I suggest is people actually start with their repeat clients because it is slightly shorter journey. However, then you can back into prospects and then you can back into other areas and actually expand on your mapping. Unique products. Uh, this is another thing companies typically forget. If you have products that are slightly unique or deviate from your standard, so for example, obviously an equipment lease, pretty standard, a dollar out, 10%, et cetera. However, think about products like uh, titled vehicles, for example. You have an added process in there, right? Titling insurance. So if you do have those products that are unique, highly suggest um, at, you know, diving into the process that the client experiences when they are financing those as well. Vendor, broker, lessor programs. So your referral sources. Oftentimes companies only focus on once a client hits their company. However, if you have referral sources like a broker, lessor, or an equipment vendor, bringing you in transactions, it's really helpful to understand the front end of that journey prior to them coming to you. Um, it helps with identifying pain points, et cetera, so highly suggest that. And then surveys. Hopefully your organization is doing a survey. However, one of the things you may wanna consider is actually having your referral partners also include financing questions uh, so you garner more information. And then obviously, Going into the next one, those wow moments. When people are spending a lot of time on their mapping, 
Uh, they're really focused on the pain points and solutions to that. This is also a great opportunity to figure out how can you incorporate those really wow moments for your clients to distinguish yourself from other financing companies. So for example, approved for more than requested. That is a win for you, it's a win for the end user, it's a win for your equipment provider. And it's like, how can you make, for example, that moment really stand out? Next slide, please. So a little bit of marketing morsel that you were served. Um, really the goal is to think big, uh, start small. And like I said, you can carve out, carve out certain types of customers where you can start the mapping process in a small way and then grow upon that. And then content obviously is going to be a very, uh, play a big uh, component to the omni-channel experience. And so our next speaker is going to dive into that as well. So Brittany, I turn it back over to you to see if we have any questions so far. Uh, Brittany, you're on mute, please, if you can unmute. Of course. Uh, one question that's no come through. Uh, can you tell us the difference between a journey map and a process map? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, so a process map is really an internal document, and it's really focused on uh, internal processes. And the big difference is it's not customer-centric. It's not focused on the client perspective. Uh, one thing I will note, though, that a process doc uh, can be very helpful if you if your organization has already developed a process doc. Referencing that when you're getting to the pain points and attrition points and trying to analyze, like, why are we losing clients, that process doc can come in play and actually help um, during uh, that activity when you're working on your mapping. Great. One more here. I think we've got time for one more. Um, do you have any suggestions for a low-cost client journey mapping tool? You know, there's actually a ton out there. Um, you know, we I won't uh, suggest like one brand. Mm -hmm. However, what I really suggest is look at your existing resources. For example, if you use Salesforce.com, uh, HubSpot, those are platforms that actually do offer free mapping tools. Now, they're going to be more uh, geared towards their specific platform. However, it is a good way if you're looking for a no-cost um, or low-cost way to just get an idea of a mapping tool. Now, in addition to that, you may want to also reach out to your ad agency and ask if, if you're working with an ad agency, obviously, uh, if they have a mapping tool or can suggest one. Um, and then in addition, there are uh, companies. So the example that I actually gave a couple slides back uh, was Lucid Chart, and that's just an example. However, they do have free downloads, and the one that was on that slide was an example of a free one. And so there are inexpensive tools uh, out there that people can obviously uh, look into, and I I know companies have actually created them from scratch themselves. Great. Thank you, Monica. You're welcome. Now we will turn it, now we will turn it over to Katie Aliquist. Thanks, Brittany. So we're gonna so for this section, we're gonna dive into content marketing. So next slide. And today we'll cover the basics of content marketing, how your company can get started, the strategy behind it, um, basic implementation, as well as promoting your content. Next slide. Okay, so for several years now, we've heard about content marketing. And it's become such a big focus, and people are companies are creating um, their entire marketing strategies around content creation. To put it simply, content marketing is planning, creating, and sharing valuable content for a target audience in order to achieve a business goal. So this is a great opportunity to create content that solves problems for customers, helps educate them on some of the services that you offer. And it can be anything that goes beyond just creating like a spec sheet for a new product or a new product release announcement. So it's all the other supporting content that helps you drive sales. And with content marketing, there's a lot of benefits that come along with it. And I've listed a few here. Um, and some of these, they're, they're not in any particular order, 
but content marketing is a great way to uh, generate leads and to really nurture people through your sales funnel. Um, as we know, everyone kind of consumes content differently. So you might create a blog or a video and those, and depending on who sees it, that could help nurture them and make them that it, make them decide it's time to buy. You can also use content marketing to increase your website traffic. If um, you're not impressed with, with how your, your pages are performing, you can create a blog and, um, and you can use the organic search ranking um, to help drive traffic there. Um, you can also use content marketing to establish yourself as an industry authority. Uh, in our industry, equipment finance, uh, there's a lot of information that people might not know. So if you've got it available for people that are conducting research on their own, then and they continue to land on your website, then they'll probably buy from you. Um, as we know, so many people, I mean, we as consumers, we all do so much research before we contact a company, or maybe we decide that we don't want to contact a company at all, and we buy online if that option is available. But creating content that speaks to um, certain needs can help build trust um, with, with those customers, and it also shows that you're an expert, which is something that we all want to, to, to prove that we are. Um, not to mention uh, awareness. We all know that with a new product launch, we want to get that out and, um, and tell everyone about it. And with content marketing, you can do that. Um, if you're a new company or you're, you've rebranded, uh, content marketing is a great way that you can establish a brand voice. Um, if, if you just are rebranding and you want to tell customers that, hey, we've changed and this is what we're focusing on, Creating different types of content is, um, is a great way to do it. And social media. Um, we all, social media is part of all of our marketing strategies these days. And having creative content that you can share on social media is a great way to increase your following and also get people to engage with your company. Next slide. Okay, so I talked about just a few different types of content that you can create, things like blogs. Um, but as you know, we all consume content differently. So um, it's really important that you have a good variety of ways that you share or repurpose, I guess, some of the same information. So um, through white papers and, and eBooks, and you could do something visual, like an infographic, you know, something for, as an example, it could be like the benefits of leasing equipment versus buying equipment. So really, it's a good opportunity to put yourself in the customer's shoes and think about how they consume and what you want to see. You know, some companies even offer quizzes. You know, um, with my company, we often talk about creating BuzzFeed style quizzes, you know, where it helps guide a customer to pick a different product or pick a specific product based on some questions that they answer. Um, webinars like this, um, email marketing, and some companies even have podcasts. So there's a lot of avenues and different types of media that you can create to solve different, different goals that you're trying to achieve. Next slide. And these are just some examples. I, I didn't want to go into um, our industry, but I chose some brands that we're all familiar with. So these are just some examples of different types of content that are out there that we're probably all familiar with. So there's um, podcasts, we all know Flow from Progressive, that's a great example of, of just content marketing and, and running with an idea. Um, same with Coke and the, the, personalized, um, the personalized soda cans, you know, that's a great way that it doesn't, it just adds that personal touch that helps resonate with people. And um, they've really, they, they ran with it and they did a great job. Um, it's also important to be uh, to keep an eye on the trends. Uh, with the picture down below, you'll see of Bernie Sanders, IKEA used it as an opportunity to sell a chair and some oven mitts. So you can have some fun with with different types of content that you create. Next slide. Okay, so getting started. I know it can sound super overwhelming with where where to begin, but three basic or three simple steps I have for you to get started with content marketing is get informed. 
There's so much online and available at your fingertips for free that you can learn the basics. Or if you want to create a team and you want uh, and you want your team to get um, educated on some of this stuff, there's there's different information available at any level that you're seeking it. So, and I have some resources at the end of my presentation that I um, have found offer great. Um, great information to just educate you on the on the latest trends or if you are completely new to it. Next is creating a budget. You don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket because then it kind of leaves you without opportunities to do something else if it doesn't go as planned. Um, content marketing shouldn't consume your entire marketing budget. Just allocate an amount that works for you and if it is proven to be successful, then continue to increase your budget every year. And most importantly, you want to set goals. Every bit of content that you should that you create should have some sort of goal tied to it. Whether you just want to create awareness about maybe a, a special offer that you that you have available, or you want to drive leads, or um, maybe increase your web traffic or engagement. Whatever it is, make sure that you set a goal because that helps you go back and you can report on it, you can review how, you can analyze your metrics and then you can refresh it if it wasn't as successful as you expected it to be. Next slide. Okay, so strategy. Three things that I think are important when developing your strategy are keeping it simple. Um, as a general best practice, uh, the the recommended reading level for just general marketing content is eighth grade. So I always think USA Today. And um, I know our industry is a bit more niche and that's okay. Uh, we can create some content that uh, does speak to specific the, the specific audience. But if you wanna create awareness, then I would recommend going as general as possible. That way that person can share it with, with anybody and they all understand it. So you just wanna make sure that depending on what the topic is, just consider how sophisticated the content is and what the customer is, is um, how they're gonna perceive it. And then next is being consistent. I once heard, um, I was at a conference and they talked about authenticity versus consistency. And, and honestly, they truly go hand in hand because if you consistently maintain a specific tone and voice, everyone is going to think that that's authentic to your brand, no matter what it is. So consistency is important. If you change your message with every bit of content that you create, it, it's confusing for the customer and it can um, leave people, it can break trust and it can really have a negative impact on your brand. And then next is get creative. Don't be afraid to push the envelope for what's acceptable for your industry. Um, it's, it's important to, to stay on, on topic of or just keep an eye on what's trending you know maybe there's an opportunity that you could fit into it you know like ikea like i mentioned earlier fitting in with the bernie sanders meme that that took over um at the beginning of the year so unique content is always more memorable and um and that's can that can be what help you goes helps you go viral and get more visibility okay next slide Implementation. So I found this quote and it really struck me. And um, I think it's so important with creating a content strategy and, and implementing it. Less than 40% of content marketers have a documented content strategy. Therefore, only 35% of content marketers can actually demonstrate the ROI of their content marketing efforts. That's less than half. So documenting your content, having a plan, I cannot stress this enough. It is so important. And you can do so by just creating a content strategy playbook. It doesn't need to be 40 pages. It can just be however many pages is appropriate for your business. Um, just having something available that you can reference if, um, if you hire somebody new or um, you just need a refresher. And um, next is having a content calendar. This is important, especially if you have um, a big team, something that's collaborative, and it just helps you stay organized. It's part of your, it can be part of your annual planning where you create maybe themes every quarter of what you wanna um, focus on. You know, for um, 
equipment leasing or equipment finance. It could be like Q1, you focus on um, maybe tax or then Q2 is leasing and loans and, and different things like that. So it's a great way to have a plan in place and identify different content opportunities that you can create based on any gaps that you might have. And I cannot stress this part enough, document your reporting process and make sure you're, you are reporting. Reporting is so important in marketing and um, it, just, it helps you it helps you be a better marketer. It helps you become more, more successful in any type of campaign that you may run or any content that you create, whether if you were creating something for lead generation. Um, and you didn't get the right amount of leads. It can help you analyze and 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 find out what went wrong with that. Um, and it can also show what you're doing well and that you should continue to do whatever it is you were creating. Next slide. Next is promoting your content. So there are so many channels and avenues for creating um, or for getting your content to the eyes of your target audience. These are just some examples here that um, I put together. It goes beyond this. Um, obviously, advertising. Display advertising is a great opportunity. Social media, paid search. Um, those can all be great for lead generation and creating awareness. Um, depending on your industry and um, if you work with some influencers, we all know, we, we all know um, like, Consumer products, those are those are pretty big, but we actually do have some just in the construction industry and tapping into those and their following could be a good opportunity if it's the right fit. Events, um, you could create different types of videos and um, all sorts of like maybe a white paper case study um, to, to share some educational information about some of the products and services that you offer. Email marketing. Um, something that um, most might not consider is online forums. So if you have a community or are aware of a community that people go to, to um, find information about something, um, what comes to mind is something like a Reddit, where it's like, um, it's just people talking about different topics. Um, that could be a great opportunity to share something about equipment finance trade publications, and just finding the right media outlets that work for you and where your customers are. Um, one of the biggest opportunities I think that um, a lot of companies can capitalize on is uh, engaging employees too, because each employee, if they're on social media, especially something like LinkedIn, they can have 100 followers and they've got followers too, and it's such a big opportunity of free promotion. So don't forget about your employees and encourage them to, to engage with your content, no matter how, um, whatever avenue you use to promote it, whether it's on social media, have them share it. It doesn't take, it doesn't take long. It's just a few seconds. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. Next slide. And as I mentioned earlier, here are some great resources that I love. Um, no affiliation with any of these, but they offer great resources. They have some free free resources as well as paid. Um, they can help you um, just learn the basics of content marketing. They can help you um, learn some of, if you're at a more sophisticated level, you can dive into that as well. Um, there's also some content on search engine optimization and Content Marketing Institute. I know they have a great conference and I think it's coming up, but um, you might look into that as well if, if you wanna learn more. But there's so much that you can do with content marketing. And that's all I get. Thank Lydia, you, do have Katie. Any we actually, yes, we do have a question that has come in here, actually a couple here. Um, I think we've got time for one question before moving on. Um, thoughts and suggestions on getting internal buy-in from sales or non-marketing stakeholders when it comes to prioritizing more inbound focused content marketing rather than traditional push marketing? That's a great question. Um, I would say that in order to get the buy-in, everyone seems to, I mean, metrics, you know, that's why metrics are so important. If you can show the facts and data to whatever you're doing and don't be afraid to just start something. 
you know, if you want to do a paid search ad, put it out there, um, get legal approval if you need it. And, um, and just, you have to start somewhere and be able to benchmark those, um, those results. You know, if you can show the ROI on anything that you're doing, then leadership buy-in is, is going to happen naturally. And leadership can also be great resources for establishing um, authority in, in your industry. And Heather's gonna talk about LinkedIn next, but that's a great opportunity to have your leaders share your content. If you put out um, a great case study on customers, have a, write a post for an executive and have them um, share it to their LinkedIn. Um, just get them involved. So I think getting their buy-in and getting their feedback, any type of um, anyone like uh, internally, I think can help your your marketing strategy. Great, thank you so much. Now I will turn the virtual stage over to Heather Friedman. Thank you, Brittany. So. Mm -hmm. As you guys have, have observed, we started on a very macro level, right? Monica gave a great presentation on omni-channel marketing and how you can start to implement those strategies into your business. We then winnowed it down a little bit further into content marketing, which is a big part of the how, how you're able to um, activate against that omni-channel. So how, how do we fit it all together? And so as we were, oh, next slide, please. As we were um, talking about giving this presentation, one of the things that came sort of came to the surface naturally was a sort of um, odd case study that I'm going to share with you all uh, from something that we did in March of 2020 uh, last year. Uh, first, I wanted to talk to you though about just using LinkedIn in general, right? It is amazing to me how, and you know, we obviously had to take a little bit of humor with this, but how people approach LinkedIn in such bizarre ways where, you know, we all have that friend who starts in a new job or a new service or a new company and literally all their posts are about them. And you just start to tune those people out pretty readily. Um, Katie touched on this in, in her presentation. It's so important to engage. If you can engage with others, not make it all about yourself, all of a sudden you're literally creating a community of like-minded individuals who are all here to further their business, whether that be, you know, in, in, the, in the leasing and financing industry or even in another industry where you can find value in, in how they contribute to your, to your environment. So I, I listed out some quick do's and don'ts and I, I won't go through all of them, but I, I do wanna talk specifically about, you know, utilizing LinkedIn as a way to connect with colleagues, both new and old. One of the very first things I did when invited to join this group was connect with all of the various folks in this group. And part of that reason is because they've, they've got ideas that I don't and they've got um, experiences that I don't. And if we've got the ability to share with one another, we all, we all become a little smarter as a result. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're participating as, I think Katie touched on this earlier, as authentically as possible. Um, none of us know everything. So even just something as simple as, throwing a question out there if you're working on a business problem that you can't necessarily solve on your own, you're, you're engaging and you're inviting other folks to, uh, to help with your success as well as theirs. Um, and then I've got, don't add your email connect or don't add your LinkedIn connections automatically to your email list. And this is a, a really big one. It's, it's literally uh, against the law. Um, and yet it's amazing to me how companies will, you know, connect with somebody on LinkedIn and then within 15 minutes, I'm getting emails and phone calls and everything else. And it's like, wow, really, I, all I did was agree to, to get to know you on, on, in the LinkedIn setting. So make sure that you're not doing that. Um, and then finally, and this is the biggest one, is don't send mass spammy email messages that show very little effort, very little care for the individual, um, and that violate the connections before transactions rule. As you guys are all in the, the environment of, meeting people and getting to know them and figuring out how and if your company can help them. And if that's your approach in real life, that should also be your approach in the social media realm in that you gotta get to know somebody before you just say, oh, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and I can help you with this. It, it becomes too much and it becomes really spammy. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is a day in the life. Um, as I was building this presentation on Sunday, don't tell Emily I built it on Sunday, but I did. Um, as I was building this on Sunday, I literally went in and took a screen grab of my LinkedIn messages. And I thought they were kind of interesting. So a couple of them in there are my employees, right? I found a great article that was super relevant to what they do specifically, or they found something that they thought could, could benefit our whole team. So we'll communicate that way. That's great. But then as you look through the, the messages that I've received, and I did not um, mask the identities of these folks to protect the innocent because they legitimately sent me these messages. Um, but for example, the very first one is dear LinkedIn member. I just thought, wow, you didn't even bother to enter in my name. It literally it says dear LinkedIn member. Then if you click through it, which I know you guys can't in this particular setting, but if you were to be able to click, click through it, it is a job that has absolutely nothing to do with any experience I've ever had. I like absolutely nothing. And I just thought, you know, that's a case of a company who bought a list, applied, you know, a very spammy message to that list and are most likely measuring, you know, Katie talked about metrics. They're most likely measuring their metrics on how many clicks did we get? How many folks actually engaged with this? Well, I engaged with it, but not for good reason. And they're never ever going to be able to woo me away to their company based on dear LinkedIn member. Um, as I mentioned, it's a great way to um, to find old colleagues. We're, we're facing a particular conundrum um, at work right now. And based on my agency past, I reached out to a programmer that we used to use. And I think he's the second or third um, conversation that I've got going there. And it's just, you know, great, great way to either pick the brain of or end up hiring somebody that I've worked with in the past and I know and I trust. And it's, it was a great way to, to reconnect with a colleague. Then numbers four through six on here are probably my least favorite example of how to use LinkedIn. There is a way with LinkedIn that you can set up an autoresponder. So say I send a request to Brittany and say, hey, Brittany, you know, let's connect on LinkedIn. I, I don't necessarily know her in this scenario. And Brittany clicks accept. Within a nanosecond, a message pops up that says, hi, Brittany, I work for Great America Financial Services and this is what we can do for you. And it's literally just spewing all about myself and my company. Th there's no level of authenticity that goes with that. Not to mention the fact I haven't taken any time at all to get to know what Brittany needs, what Brittany wants. Maybe she's just somebody that I met at a conference and she has absolutely no possibility of becoming a customer, but boy, she'd be a really great resource down the road. So number four through six were people that chose to use autoresponders. And you'll notice, I don't even think I clicked on a couple of them because it just, you know what they are. When they, when they pop up the moment you hit accept, you know what they are. Um, they are a terrific way, however, I will say, um, I know that all of us have at one point in time or another been uh, solicited by um, recruiters on LinkedIn. And again, those are ones that are you know, somewhat, they can be somewhat spammy. And so I tend to ignore those. But as I am hiring for positions, I did my own sort of search in, within my own network. Who are folks that I know that are at a certain level and might benefit from either expanding their world or bumping up a level or bringing a level of expertise to a role that we need. So I've also been able to use LinkedIn as a way to reach out credibly to folks that I'm, I'm legitimately hiring for. And I'm, I'm not a recruiter. I'm not working on behalf of any organization. It is literally a job that I have in my back pocket that I know I'm hiring for. And I know that these people would be a really good fit for. Um, and then finally, I mentioned, do not send daily emails, videos, LinkedIn messages, if you don't know each other. So again, back to my example, I connect with Brittany. I maybe take the moment to go in and read her profile, find out what she's about. And then I start barraging her with multiple emails. Maybe I put her into our, 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 um, our contact phone call list, um, send her multiple e LinkedIn messages. Maybe I even do a great video of myself saying, hey, Brittany, it's nice to, nice to meet you. It's, it's too much. It's that guy at the party who, you know, comes on too strong and you and you just slowly back away. So treat any interaction on social media like you would treat an interaction in real life. That's that's not at all how you would how you would engage with someone in real life. So don't do it on, on LinkedIn if at all humanly possible. Next slide, please. 
So what does this mean, right? So we took sort of that philosophy of building legitimate, credible, honest to goodness relationships, and we wanted to apply it to Con Expo of 2020, right? At the time, people were still meeting in person in Vegas, no less. So about two months prior to, a little bit more than that, about, about two months prior to the trade show, uh, the strategic marketing director and I sat down and said, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have at this, at this um, expo is that it is so large that it makes it really hard to have those genuine conversations with potential clients right so monica talked a little bit about those those stages of the of the map of the journey and awareness and consideration if i don't know who you are i'm certainly not going to going to want to consider you or connect with you so we don't have strong numbers tied necessarily which as a marketer that's you know like shame on me but we knew that we wanted to increase booth visits and pre-scheduled appointments. We didn't tie a number to it because we've never done anything like this. So this was sort of our benchmark year and what an interesting year to choose for a benchmark year. <laughs> so as I mentioned, um, we chose Con Expo, which is, as you, I'm sure you all know, is the uh, North America's largest construction trade show and pay special attention to those dates because that will um, have an impact a little bit later in the next slide. So, we came up with our strategies, which were create both inbound and outbound messaging. So you go back to Katie's message of content, right? We don't have a, you know, 25 strong person team or a marketing agency that can create all of this content for us. But we knew that by creating and curating and providing valuable content to the folks that we wanted to connect with, that it was a very credible way to show we're in your industry, we understand this industry and, and we're a part of it, right? So I've got some examples on here of content that we shared. We didn't write it, we didn't create it. It truly was, was you know, to Katie's point of being an expert, part of being an expert is acknowledging that we don't need to create or provide everything. So a lot of this campaign actually in, um, included curated content as well as our own internal created content. We then worked with each of our sales reps and I'll tell you that the biggest win from this entire case study was working with our sales reps and helping them to winnow down, you know, from literally the world's largest, right? That's just enormous and it's daunting and it's and it's too big. So we said, okay, give us your top 50. Give us the top 50 customers that if at the end of the expo, you were able to meet with these folks, you would just be so happy with yourself. And so they did, they, they each submitted 50. And, and I don't mean 50 companies, I mean 50 individuals, right? So it wasn't necessarily that I wanna meet with 50 companies, I wanna meet with these people within this company, okay? So then we did a deep dive and those of us in the marketing team who were a part of this literally took those lists. And I think we ended up with a list of a hundred, I think by the, at the end of the day. And we went through and we checked them out on LinkedIn, right? It wasn't a, we didn't make any attempt to connect at this point. We literally were just figuring out, you know, if I connect with Monica and she's really active on LinkedIn, what's my strategy? But if I create, connect with Katie and she's not really active on, you know, is there, is there a difference in strategy there? So we went through and we literally went company by company and individual by individual and we figured out how, how involved and how engaged they already were on this social media platform. Many of them were not at all. Like we literally had some folks that were on the list and they weren't even, they didn't even have a presence on LinkedIn. Well, that makes it really easy, right? So now I'm no longer wasting my time on a LinkedIn strategy for somebody who doesn't necessarily engage or play in LinkedIn. So we removed those folks immediately, which was easy, scary, I think, for the sales folks who were like, wait, what do you mean you're taking names off my list? And I was like, if they're not on LinkedIn, we're not going to attempt to reach out to them on LinkedIn because all you're, all you're gonna do is bother them at that point in time. So then next we created content and it was anything from videos to, um, as, as, you, as you see there, there are a couple of different articles. Um, we even went so far as to ghostwrite some of the initial um, reach out messages so that our, our reps didn't feel daunted or didn't feel like, 
oh man, this is going to be a ton of work for me. We wanted this to be successful and we wanted to show our sales reps that we were in it to win it as much as they were. Uh, next slide, please. So some of our tactics. Um, the only paid component to this entire campaign was a video that we created. Um, and, the, and the nice thing too, if for those of you who are familiar with LinkedIn, you have the ability when working with LinkedIn to um, identify either by industry or by geography. There's, there's a lot of different ways to winnow down, but we, we were able to select who would even see this video. And the video was very much designed and meant to, um, meant to play with autoplay, right? So autoplay, if you are a company that does an autoplay video, which basically means that you're in your LinkedIn feed and it, and it shows up in your feed, and the minute that you scan over it, it starts to play. On one hand, that's really great, right? But it also can give the, the company that's doing it an inflated or unrealistic um, list of who actually viewed this, partially because a lot of companies are still doing ads that require sound, right? It's a lot of little pictures and there's voiceover or there's you know um, a conversational interaction between people on, on these videos. Well, if I'm at work, and I am maybe preparing for a trade show and I'm a salesperson, I've got 8 million other things going on. I don't likely have the sound on, on LinkedIn. So we intentionally created a video that could be understood very easily. It's lots of big, bold words and big, bold pictures, but it, can, it was very intentionally meant to be able to play on autoplay with no sound. Um, as I mentioned too, we took that list of top 50 each and we, we winnowed it way down. And then we created um, both a guideline for the rep. So I know it seems um, like it should just be second nature that you know you make a connection with somebody and then you, but it was it was easier for the reps if we could kind of create a, a menu for them of sorts. And it wasn't, it certainly was not meant to be restrictive or telling them how to do their jobs. It was really much meant, meant, meant more to be, hey, here's a cadence that you can follow that feels natural, that feels really good, and it started with engaging with the other person. So rather than it be us creating all of this content or even curating all of this content and saying, okay, on Monday, you're gonna connect with them. On Tuesday, you're gonna send them this article. On Thursday, you're gonna send them this article. Instead, that first full week was all about engaging with that person. You had to either ask them a question about a post that they had posted, liked something that they had done, or even posted something on their wall that was relevant to them and not anything at all about us. And again, you look at forming relationships and it's just a much more natural way to say, hey, I'm interested, you know, we've, we've now connected, I'm interested in what you do in your world. And so they were literally assigned time to go through each person's um, profile, their experiences, because it was, it was easier to find connections when you actually invested the time, which again is why starting with that giant universe of everybody and then winnowing it down to our top 50 and then winnowing it down to, I think about top 15, 10 to 15, depending on who it was, that's manageable. That's not insurmountable where you're thinking as a rep, oh my goodness, I don't have time to get through these, this number of people. 10 people, you can do that, that's, that's, that's not bad at all. So as I mentioned, we created a guideline. We also then went into each of our reps' profiles and we helped them beef up their own profiles. Uh, we added new header art. We made sure everybody had professional looking bio photos. Um, we made sure that if they needed a, a professional personal video that that was created for them. And then as I mentioned, we helped them identify where to engage, when to engage. There were times when we would actually log on ourselves and kind of monitor and see what they were doing and make sure that even our own team was making some of those posts. Um, and then the, the targeted campaign that I mentioned uh, that you see right there to the left is um, was, was targeted directly to upper management to C-suite. So as you go back to what Monica did earlier and she, one of the very first slides she showed you was identifying that persona and figuring out who is it that I want to, that I want to talk to. If I want to get stuck with a gatekeeper, well, then I'm going to go you know, down on more of an admin level. But we knew that the folks that we wanted to talk to were at the C level. So we successfully were able to reach 
1,300 people, approx, um, with over 650 views and five click-throughs. I know that number seems really tiny, but you have to keep in mind that anytime we're able to have somebody click through and engage with us, even, even one customer as a result of this was a win, right? Um, of the 652 views, 21 were CEOs, 43 were branch or sales managers, and 83 were at the VP or president level. Those are the folks we want to talk to. And particularly when we're going to Con Expo, those are the folks that we want to talk to. Our entire spend for this entire campaign was $100, I'm, I'm, which seems crazy, right? And yet garnering even just a couple of um, engagements and relationships. And, and as we all know, as marketers, relationships take a long time. It's not a you know one and done and we're super excited to do business with you in five seconds flat. It's gonna take a little time. So as we look at our results, and I, and I purposely do not have a results page on this case study because as I mentioned a few slides up, the expo is March 10th through the 13th. And so we had not only our own sales reps, um, not many of our own sales reps not go to the expo. Obviously lots of people didn't go. The good news though for us is that it did garner two new customers. So we were able to take it from, hey, we're really, and, and we actually kind of had some fun with it then after was, hey, sorry, we didn't get to see you at the expo. We're all in quarantine, but I'd love to set up a video call. So it also allowed us to pivot in a way that was relevant and a little funny and and timely. Um, but, it, but you know, for a hundred dollars and just sort of sitting down and concentrating on what we wanted to do, it, it had a, a very relevant and very real um, impact on our on our company. Thank you, Heather. We have some questions that have come in for you in particular. First question is, would you recommend using LinkedIn Sales Navigator or LinkedIn Premium um, for your strategy? Yeah, kind of. I will, I'll be honest, we didn't for this particular campaign. We didn't find that we needed it. Um, we have since experimented with it a little bit um, to, to um, varied success, I think is the, the, the nicest way to say that. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely has value if you if you want to put in a ton of effort and, and utilize the tool for all that it can do for you, please do. It's it is genuinely a dynamic tool. Um, because this was a benchmark year and because we were experimenting, and I, and I will tell you we are going to do this again um, this year. But because of those reasons, um, we didn't feel that we needed to. All of the information that we wanted to find, I was able to find with just a regular every, you know, sort of every man's LinkedIn um, profile. I, you know, I didn't have premium. We didn't use Navigator. It was truly just hunting and pecking and going and engaging with these folks in a, in a credible way. Great, one more question for you. And we don't have too much time here. Uh, how many marketing team members worked on the targeted LinkedIn campaign? We have a very small team, so I want to set realistic expectations with staff should be engaged with this type of initiative. Yep, two. Uh, I was myself and the strategic marketing director for this particular function uh, or business unit, sorry. Um, yeah, and, and, and that again, to be honest, that's a big part of why we use curated content, right? Like we didn't have time. We only, we only had about seven weeks total on this project and to, to spend all that time writing blogs and creating content that if we're being honest, if all of a sudden I was churning out all of this content that had to do with Con Expo that has never been seen before, it doesn't look authentic. So for us to be able to pull in like that EL, ELFA article that was out there, I didn't write it, I didn't ask for it, I, I had nothing to do with it. We simply searched and found it really relevant. Um, we did do some content of our own, of course, but um, yeah, two people. Thank you, thank you. One more question here. What do you think about putting your real email and your content info in LinkedIn? I'm wondering if they mean like real versus like your personal versus your work email. Um, uh, so for 15 years, my real email and my work email were one and the same because I owned an ad agency. And in part, that was great. <laughs> And in part, then your worlds really, really start to collide. So when I went to Great America, I elected to separate those two worlds. And so I would only put my professional on my LinkedIn profile. And 
to that very first slide that I had posted, the problem that in putting any sort of email address is that there are unfortunately a lot of people out there who don't um, who don't subscribe to the spam can act and they will take that email address and they will add it to a campaign without your permission um, and without an opt out. So personally, I, I don't even, to be honest, I don't even remember if mine is still out there, um, but I will say it irritates me when I've connected with somebody on LinkedIn and I immediately start getting phone calls and email emails from them because I just think, well, you know, you've, you've got a way to reach me. I hit accept when we were talking via LinkedIn. Why don't, why don't we stay here first before we, you know, take the relationship to another world? So I, I kind of have mixed feelings on that. I would definitely not put personal um, unless, okay, so caveat to that. If you are somebody who is looking for a job and you are looking or you're utilizing LinkedIn for a job, absolutely positively do not put your professional email address as your email because that would be really awful. So I guess it really just depends on, on how you're gonna use it. Thank you. Let me see if there are any other additional audience questions. I think, I think we are good. Actually, um, Katie, this one is for you. How can you make your content go viral? Hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's not an easy answer for that. I think if uh, I had the answer to that, I'd probably be a millionaire. But um, but really, it's it's it kind of goes to show the need and just why it's important to create different types of content because you never know what could go viral. You know, um, if you're really solving a need for somebody and they share it with other people with the same need then it just, it, it keeps growing from there. So being mindful of the content that you create um, and in posting regularly, I would say, is is also an opportunity, but there's really no surefire way to, to make it go, to go viral, even if you pay for it. Um, there, there's just no, no true answer to that. And how often should we post new content to our LinkedIn? So the answer for that, again, is it depends. So it depends on what type of content we're talking about. If you're talking about a blog, there's best practices for that. So generally, it's at least once a week in a perfect world. Um, but social media, you know, I've read studies where people follow and, um, and they only see posts from a brand every couple of months and they're okay with that. But it's just whatever makes sense for your marketing team, whatever doesn't um, like weigh you guys down where you're in over your head and you have too much to to work on. But but yeah, I would say there, there's definitely recommendations of the cadence for posting with whatever type of content that you create. You know, social media doesn't take very long to to write a post and, and get that out there. But if you're creating a case study or a white paper, that takes a lot more time um, with editing. So whatever works for you, um, I think is fine. I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing to have too much content. That just means that you have more places for people to, to connect with your brand. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending today. We are coming down um, to the top of the hour here. Um, if you do wanna learn more about um, being a member on the ELFA communications member, please reach out to Amy Vo. We've got a great group of like-minded marketing communications professionals from the industry. Um, just a really great supportive group. Um, and we'd love to have you um, add more value to our, our group. So please reach out and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Brittany. Um, yeah, thank you to our attendees. Um, and I'd like to thank our fantastic panel as well. Um, I hope you all uh, who attended found a few helpful takeaways. Um, again, as a reminder, uh, the session was recorded and will be available to replay later this week. You'll also receive a survey after the session ends. Please take a moment to fill it out and let us know your thoughts on today's webinar. Also, please be sure to join us on August 25th for the next session in our ELFA Wednesday webinars at 1, uh, the ELFA Credit Manager Survey, with the Collection Manager Survey to follow on September 1st. Further information for both can be found on the web seminars page that I have linked above. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.